I've been interested in aviation since as long as I can remember. Um, when I was really, really young, my, uh, my dad obviously took me to his, uh, his parents' place where he'd built hundreds of model aeroplanes uh, up in the attic and I proceeded to trash them all playing with them, which was uh, really disappointing on his part, but you know, I, I love playing with the aeroplanes. It wasn't long after that we moved out to Sardinia and my mum tells a story about you know, I'd be in some airport departures lounge you know, in the 1970s as only a couple of years old, you know, wowing the, pass wowing the rest of the passengers by telling them that, oh, look, the Air France Caravelle is push pushing back and the such and such BAC 111 is doing something else. And they're all very impressed with my spot of knowledge. So, um, yeah, I've always been interested in aviation. What was your first flying experience? Other than commercial flying, um, I joined the Air Cadets when I was 13 years and three months old. Uh, and a couple of months after that, I went air experience flying uh, with um, squadron leader Bill Purgis at uh, RAF Leeming. Number, I think it was 11 AAF at RAF Leeming. Um, and that was my first flight, so loops, barrel rolls, all that sort of stuff at the tender age of 13. It was good. When did you join the RAF? Uh, I commissioned, I tested and commissioned in 1999, but I'd actually been doing flying training for four years prior to that while I was at university. So I joined East Midlands University Air Squadron uh, off the back of my degree at Loughborough University uh, and spent four years on the University Air Squadron, effectively doing my elementary flying training while in parallel to, uh, to my degree. So what was your training like and what did you fly? So all the way back to the start, I think if I was to sum up my Air Force career, if I was to write a book about my career, it would be, I'd probably title it The Unlikely Pilot. Um, I struggled as much as you can probably struggle through flying training and still achieved a fast jet at the at the end of it. So uh, my training on the University Air Squadron, I think it's probably fair to say I was just a late bloomer. So I struggled initially and then uh, and then came good in the end. And the same was probably true, not so much at Linton, but definitely at Valley uh, when I was doing the uh, the Hawk flying on 208 Squadron. Uh, but things seemed to come good uh, at the end when I was on 19 Squadron, the more tactical side of it. Um, I was selected to go to the Tornado F3. Uh, and I spent a year, sorry, uh, one tour, so three years uh, on the Tornado F3 at 25 Squadron RAF Leeming. What was your role on the Tornado F3? Uh, I was just a shag pilot. Am I allowed to say shag? Not sure. I was a line pilot on the Tornado F3. Uh, so combat ready, day and night, uh, electro-optical. Um, I would do QRA, so national QRA, NATO QRA, and uh, yeah, participated in multinational exercises with the squadron. How long did you spend on the Titan? Uh, three years, so one tour, um, 500 hours, uh, and then I was posted off to RAF Valley. Did you enjoy flying it? Uh, looking back, yes I did. Um, in my, once again, the unlikely pilot, um, in my early, early days on the, uh, on the aircraft I found it a real struggle, uh, I won't lie to you, um, but uh, as with all things, it all came good at the end. And uh, yeah, towards the end of it, I really enjoyed flying the F3. It was fast, certainly fast at low level, uh, wasn't so good when you took it up medium level, but that's what happens when you turn a low level bomber into a fighter. Um, and the weapon system that the aircraft had, so decent radar, the JTIDs, uh, Datalink, AMRAM and ASRAM, meant that the uh, aircraft was capable uh, in its role as, a, as an interceptor. So the Tornado F3 for me, that was my first operational tour, first and last operational tour. And uh, as a junior pilot on a, on a squadron, it's just a fantastic experience, you know, being able to go away with a, a set of comrades and, uh, and do the job, be it on exercises uh, in the United States or sitting and launching on QRA uh, down from RAF Con Coningsby or RAF Marham. Um, to be brutally honest, my overriding memory of being on the Tornado F3 was uh, a chat that we had from, the, um, from a London police borough who came up to talk to us about the implications of shooting down airliners in the post 9-11 uh, kind of era. Uh, that would have been our role had it have ever come to it and it was kind of a chilling reminder that training is over and should it all go wrong and you'd be called up to do the job then you know it would be a really serious thing that you'd be doing. Um, a lot of people left that brief you know really having a good long think about you know what it would be like to pull the trigger and potentially bring down an airliner with a, a couple of hundred people on board and I the guys who now do the job, the, t the Typhoon crews, uh, both in the UK and down in the Falkland Islands, have my unending respect for the um, professionalism and skill with which they carry out that role. So, uh, standard Air Force tour, three years long, 
Uh, two and a bit years in, your poster, the guy who assigns you to a role within the Air Force, comes along to have a chat and I made the mistake of mentioning the V word, Valley. Uh, once you've mentioned that, that's it, you're stuffed and, uh, and off you go. And that was very much my thought as I was posted to Valley. So um, I did my ground school at Valley uh, on the Hawk. Uh, start that again. So I did my, ground my Hawk ground school at uh, RAF Valley and I was selected to go to 19 Squadron, which is the, uh, the tactical weapons um, squadron, which was a real godsend actually. Um, it, you know, very varied flying. You could be flying air combat in the morning and then low level uh, attack in the afternoon, teaching students, maybe leading a solo student on your wing. And it was, you know, fantastic varied flying, uh, which was great. What was your first impression of the Hawk T1 as an instructor? As an instructor, my first impression or my first thought was help, this thing doesn't have a heads up display. So after three years on the Tornado F3, it's fair to say I'd become something of a hood cripple. And uh, my first few flights in the Hawk, uh, I really had to struggle to go back to those basic principles that you learn all the way through training, so Bulldog, Takano, Hawk, of you know, fly the aircraft, setting attitudes, using the instruments, things like that, not just relying on the green writing in the, uh, in the, in the glass in front of you. So that, um, that took me a while to get spun up. It's a very simple aeroplane. I mean, I remember reading a, an interview that Phil Bird, the last display pilot of the Hawk did, and he said that you could get it started in something silly like 11 button presses or something like that. It's really, really simple, uh, which is great from one point of view, but at the same time, it's not great if you're training a student to go forward and fly, you know, a Typhoon or an F-35, things like that. So when I first went to the Hawk in 2005, even then it was very apparent that we needed to do something to, to change the aeroplane. What was the Hawk T1 like to fly? Uh, it's, you speak to anyone who's flown it and they will liken it to a sports car and it really is. It's like a little sports car. Once you get comfortable with the aeroplane and you go out to the jet, you feel like you're strapping it on. You don't feel like you're climbing it in, climbing into the aircraft. You feel like you're, uh, you're strapping the jet on. Uh, and that would be my overriding memory of the aircraft really. Very, very simple, good fun to fly. Uh, no frills, I think is probably a good uh, way to describe it. Yeah. Was it hard stepping, stepping back from the F3? Yes, no doubt about it. The lack of the heads-up display, the lack of the avionics, and dare I say it, and all the fast jet mates who know me will, uh, will take the mick out of me for this, but the lack of a navigator to help, you know, just help with mundane tasks meant that all of a sudden I'm working hard as a single pilot uh, again, and um, it took me a while to get spun up to, to that level. Can you tell us um, how you went about training students? So students would come to us, uh, from 208 Squadron, so they'd already be competent to fly the aircraft solo, they'd know how to get it airborne, land it, fly in cloud, fly at night, close formation, aerobatics, they'd be all over that sort of stuff. We'd take the product that can fly the aeroplane and then teach them how to fight it. So we teach them air combat, we teach them surface attack, um, guys on the squadron would take them down the range and get them to release weapons. You know, we had a gun clearance and a, a 3kg bomb clearance at the time. And we'd bring all those elements together at the end of the course in a, an evasion style op type sortie, which would see the guys evading an air threat to get to a target, simulate weapon here on a target and then fight their way back home again. Could you explain the cockpit of the T1? Yeah, if you imagine every dial that you've ever seen in your life and then you cram it into a cockpit, that's the cockpit of a Hawk T1. That's very cynical. Um, very much a 1960s, early 70s cockpit. So lots of dials, lots of strip gauges. Um, everything, if you imagine the cockpit, everything down here rather than up top. Um, but once again, very, very simple. You know, tried and tested and it works. Was the back cockpit exactly the same as the front? Uh, exactly is a massive word, so it wasn't exactly the same, but it was similar enough. You couldn't start the jet from the back cockpit, but once the jet was up and running, then you had everything you needed. And it was certainly, in, in terms of the instrument scan that you would use for looking around the cockpit, maybe when flying in cloud, it was very, very similar to the front seat. Overall, did you enjoy flying the T1? Yes, yeah, I did. As I say, great fun to fly. Um, and the whole tour was made good by as with all things in the military, it's the people, not necessarily what you're doing or where you're doing it. You know, so good people on a good squadron uh, with a couple of good bosses. Yeah, it was really good fun. So the Hawk T2 was well, originally known as the Hawk AJT, became the Hawk 128 and then became the Hawk T2. Uh, that 
process of selecting a team started in about 2008 when, um, when it became apparent that we were going to be buying the T2 and we were going to need to bring the thing into service at some point. So how did that happen? I registered my interest, obviously, um, very, very early on. Uh, and I was actually selected to go to Bruff, uh, not a million miles away from here actually, and advise the software development team on what the radar should look like and how the radar functionality should work. So I was um, assisting the requirements manager who was an RAF squadron leader and I'd effectively be de-released de from the squadron for maybe a day or two days a month down to Bruff, sit in a few meetings, discuss what the radar would look like and then, uh, and then back to Valley and be a QFI for the rest of the time. And that exposure to the world of the T2 within the RAF kind of planted the flag for me that I was interested uh, in the team, uh, interested in being part of the team. Uh, moving forward from that, once the RAF aircraft started rolling off the production line, so the first uh, two aircraft, the RAF had a, a process where we would do fitness for purpose flying on the jets to make sure, as the, as the name implies, that the jets were fit for training students. And so in the classic knee-jerk way that the Royal Air Force works, um, myself and one of the other guys, a guy called John Letton, were asked to put together what a fitness for purpose sortie might look like. Uh, we literally just sat there in the office one day, wrote down a, a list of things that we'd like to check on a sortie, and then submitted that. Uh, a couple of weeks later, we get the call saying, right, you're now off to Wharton to go and fly that sortie. OK, you wrote the thing, you can go and test fly it. Brilliant. So, um, so that was our first trips in the aircraft. And once again, these, just these little kind of nibbing away at the, um, at the team uh, meant that our names were known. And, uh, and when it came to, to pull together the first six names, uh, myself and John were, were part of that six. Did it take long to convert from the T1 to the T2? No, I mean a hawk is a hawk is a hawk. So uh, it, f you know, it looks like a hawk. It kind of flies like a hawk. The difference is actually the the avionics and the um, the MFDs in cockpit. So to actually convert to it, that was ten sorties flown out of Wharton um, with BAE Systems pilots. Uh, and at the end of that, we were we we passed an instrument rating check, and we'd been exposed to pretty much all elements of the syllabus. Um, so we were good to go at that point. Where the ch uh, training sorties changed? The training sorties between T1 and T2? Okay, yeah, definitely. So T1, the best way to describe the Hawk T2, without stepping too far ahead in your questions, is to, is to assume that the worst thing BA Systems ever did was call the T2 a Hawk, okay? So yes, it looks like a Hawk, it kind of flies like a Hawk, but inside it's a completely different animal uh, in the cockpit. If you were to imagine a 1976 Ford Fiesta and then compare that to a 2016 Ford Fiesta, then actually that's, that's the level of difference that you've got between the, uh, the Hawk T1 and the T2. Supposedly there are only two common parts between the aircraft, uh, the canopy and the air brake, allegedly, uh, and the rest are completely new spec for the T2. So, given that the aircraft is so fundamentally different, it would be completely remiss of us just to copy and paste the Hawk T1 syllabus. The, um, the centerpiece of the Hawk T2, really, from a training perspective, is the data link that the aircraft carries. So it's a Hawk to Hawk, T2 to T2 data link, which transmits effectively aircraft position, um, aircraft vector is probably a better way to describe it, and then other characteristics to all of the Hawk T2s. And if you filter that information, what you can actually do is you can create synthetic radar within the cockpit. So we get a student, we sit him or her in, fire up the jet, and on the left-hand MFD, we can display something which, to all intents and purposes, has the form, fit and function of a Typhoon radar. Now that we've got that, well, then we can start teaching Typhoon style, not, ty not you know, exactly the same, but Typhoon style intercept tactics. So introducing AMRAM, introducing SCADE, Banzai, QRA type intercept procedures, and all of these things that we do on the T2 means that they don't have to do it on Typhoon. And if you imagine that whatever the number is, the T2 costs about one-tenth Per hour to fly uh, compared to flying a typhoon for an hour then you're saving uh, Great Britain PLC a lot of money by doing that training in a Hawk by doing it in a typhoon. So did the syllabus change? Yes it did. Uh, we've gone for a lot more systems management and if I was to have a concern my concern would be that there's not quite so much aircraft handling okay so the guys and girls aren't getting as much aircraft handling as they would have going through a Hawk T1 syllabus. So the Hawk T2, when we put a student into the front cockpit, and the student will only ever go in the front cockpit, what we want him or her to believe is that they're sat in a frontline jet. Imagine Typhoon, late model F-18, something like that. 
So uh, the cockpit is dominated by a heads-up display, reasonably small, but then it's a small cockpit, and three multifunction colour displays on which you can display a lot of information. So anything from synthetic radar, synthetic radar warning receiver, hydraulics format, communications format, a moving map, which all of a sudden makes navigating around wheels very, very easy. Uh, honestly, in the Hawk T1, navigating around with a map, a stopwatch and a compass isn't exactly what we'd want to be training our uh, tornado pilots to be doing. So having you know, representative mission systems of frontline aircraft is a real bonus. And that's, um, that's one of the real benefits that the Hawk T2 trainees take with them to the front line, that they now don't need to worry about mission systems because they've learned all that on the Hawk. They can move forward and learn tactics and procedures. So other bits and pieces with the cockpit, as I say, we're trying to replicate a Typhoon. So lots and lots of HOTAS. Um, obviously we only have one throttle for the one engine, Typhoon has two, but there's a lot of functionality there on the throttle. You've got uh, communication switches, you've got air brake, combat flap, um, chaff flare, relight buttons, scanner positions for the radar. Moving across to the stick, you've got controls for the radar on the stick, weapon selector, trigger, air to surface weapons release, and then your, uh, your trims. So lots and lots of uh, HOTAS there. Piano players are definitely encouraged to fly the aircraft. Could the T2 carry weapons? Could the T2? Excellent question. Yes, the T2 could carry weapons. No, the T2 does not carry weapons. So the aircraft is um, fitted with and plumbed for hard points across the, uh, the hard points on the wing and actually under the, uh, the fuselage of the aircraft too. Uh, however, the decision was made not to do live weaponry on the Royal Air Force aircraft and that was purely a financial decision. So doing live weaponry, it's stressful on the aircraft, the profiles are stressful, the releasing the weapons is stressful and that just erodes the, the uh, service life of the jet. And we wanted to get a minimum of 25 years out of the 28 T2s that we bought. So in order to not strip away that life, the decision was made to employ only simulated weapons. So is that a problem? Yes and no. The, the weapons that we would be employing on the, on the T2 would probably be a gun and probably practice bombs. The RAF does not employ dumb bombs anymore. Okay, so if we were going to practice anything worthwhile for, for the front line from a bombing point of view, it would be with a precision weapon, which we can't really simulate with dumb bombs. So there's nothing really missed there. The gun is obviously still useful for, um, for strafe attacks and things like that. Uh, and it is a bit of a shame that the guys and girls who come through flying training now don't actually get to release a live weapon until they get to the frontline aeroplane. Because there is, you know, that first sortie that you're going to go off and strafe, there's a little bit of apprehension there. Um, and it was nice to be able to download that from the front line. And now we've kind of uploaded that stress, if you like, to the front line. So could the, uh, could the T2 carry weapons? Uh, yes, it could. No, it doesn't. And provably it could, because other nations who use similar marks of the, the, uh, the Hawk, so thinking the South Africans, uh, the, uh, the Saudis are buying um, a very similar mark, and the Yamanis are. My understanding, and I could be wrong, is that all of those um, nations do employ live weapons. The Australians certainly do, um, in the training rule, but, uh, but they can employ live weapons. So uh, standard training sorties on the Hawk T2 um, would be, right, you know, when the guys and girls first come to the squadron, it's the basics of getting airborne, landing the thing, instrument flying, flying at night, close formation, those kind of conversion elements that convert them from being a Takano pilot to being a Hawk pilot. Once we've got that out of the way, then the guys and girls move on to radar, so 1v1 radar, 2v1 radar, 1v1 and 2v1 air combat, uh, some academic range work, uh, they'll then look at surface attack um, out in the wilds in, uh, in North Wales. And that's very much the, the bread and butter of the squadron role. So instructors teaching trainees how to become fast jet pilots. Um, there are obviously some good deals. Um, we'll get visiting aircraft come over. So we had um, Finnish Hawk Mark 51s came over a couple of years ago. Did a bit of DACT with them, which was great fun. Um, fighting a Mark 51, it's effectively a Hawk T1, so much lighter, much more nimble. Uh, and they actually put up a really, really good fight. We've also done DACT versus the Typhoon, which, as you can imagine, is generally quite a short fight. Uh, but occasionally we get lucky, or the Typhoon pilot goes unsighted on us, and, uh, and you know we'll get a couple of kills. So it's, um, it's horses for courses. The great thing about DACT, especially, is that it just energizes the squadron personnel again. Okay, so it gives them something to look forward to, it gives them a new challenge, rather than, I'm not gonna use the word mundane, but the day-to-day -day task of, of, of student training sorties. There's always something a, a student can do to, uh, to make a very benign sortie very interesting. So in terms of performance characteristics, the, I'll caveat all of this with the strong suite of the aircraft isn't 
performance. Okay, going supersonic, that is just a number changing in the hood these days. It's not like Chuck Yeager, you know, breaking the sound barrier back in the day. So the strong suit is the avionics and the mission system and the mission system training that we can give the guys and girls before they go off to, to the front line. However, in terms of raw numbers, then it's annoying. Then um, the RF aircraft is cleared to, uh, to Mach 1, BA systems clear it to Mach 1.2. Um, and at low level, like a lot of British aircraft, that's where the aircraft really excels. So it's, you know, it's fast. The um, Rolls-Royce Adore uh, Mark 951 is really the heart of the aeroplane. And uh, at low level, very, very powerful. The FADEC, the Full Authority Digital Engine Control, means you can effectively carefree handle the engine um, in pretty much any flight regime. And uh, yeah, down, down low, when you kick that thing into full power, pretty quickly you can be doing 500 plus knots which is uh, for a little jet is is good fun i mean it's not going to be a typhoon or a c27 or anything like that but it's it's good fun being involved in the t2 program was without doubt you know the professional highlight of my air force career you know as a flight lieutenant to have the trust if you like of the air force to make decisions about what effectively their last manned fast jet trainer is going to look like was an incredible honour and a real privilege uh, and I'm eternally you know thankful for that. The, um, the guy who we had in charge of the team, uh, then squadron leader, now wing commander Dan Beard, did a great job of harnessing each member of the team you know to their individual strength to really get the best out of the aircraft as, uh, as we brought it into service. So yeah it was a real pleasure. The, um, the aircraft itself is great, great fun to fly, it's not an aerobatic machine like a, like a Hawk T1 but as a, as a training platform, in my mind, and I appreciate I'm probably quite biased, it's, uh, it's up there to be the best in the world. So I left the Air Force with 1,053 Hawk T2 hours, uh, which put me uh, as the most experienced Hawk T2 pilot uh, in the Air Force, and by definition, therefore, the world. Um, I narrowly beat uh, another guy, one of the other guys who brought the jet into service, a guy called John Letton, uh, his record of, I think, 1,006 hours. So I was really fortunate to... Uh, to get my hours uh, when I did and then leave. Um, I've got a caveat that, though with the fact that John got his hours while he was in the Air Force. I got my last, I think, 50 hours um, as a civilian working for BAE Systems, so I'm not sure if that counts. <laughs> and out of both of them, which one did you prefer? T2. T2, that's T it, T2? Yeah. T2, yeah, T2's arrogantly, it's my baby. It's not my baby. You know, thousands of people worked on bringing that jet into service, but. I'm really proud of my contribution to it and uh, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed my time on the jet and as I said earlier, on the squadron, you know, good people, you know, working hard together under some reasonably adverse circumstances at times to produce a really, really good product. You're also a budding air-to-air -air photographer. How did this come about? Uh, more through look than judgment, really. Um, before going down the Falklands on my second tour with the uh, Tornado F3, I bought an entry-level digital SLR camera, uh, and that kind of got me into the photography, you know, taking photos of the, the penguins and all that sort of stuff down in the Falklands. Um, and then when I moved to Valley, uh, it was a, at a time when 19 Squadron were painting up one of their aircraft as a, um, in the colours of a 1939 Spitfire. So you might have seen it, it was known as the Hawk Fire. I think it was XX184 was the, uh, the tail. And it was painted up beautifully in the colours of a 1939 uh, 19 Squadron Spitfire. And I was asked to go and do the air-to-air -air photos for that. So I didn't take my little Canon EOS 300D. I was actually lent a, um, a decent camera and really enjoyed the experience of taking that flying, directing a formation and getting some you know, really nice shots. So um, over the period of the next few years, whenever there was an opportunity to sit in a free back seat of, say, a formation sortie, I'd sit in there with my camera and just get used to taking photos in the fast jet airborne environment, you know, learning the pitfalls, canopy reflections, the thickness of the canopy, positioning the, air, uh, the other aircraft, things like that. And it became something that I really enjoyed, and I subsequently enjoyed the editing of the photos too. So uh, off the back of that, I've flown with quite a few types now, all, generally all Royal Air Force, um, so obviously lots of Hawks, um, Pumas, out of Benson, Chinooks, uh, Typhoons, uh, and I've flown with the Red Arrows twice, which in terms of actual physical flying and being exposed to a, a squadron was without doubt one of the highlights of my Air Force career. Okay, As a 
not gifted enough pilot, okay, and there's a lot of us out there, not gifted enough to join the team, you go through your Air Force career kind of referring to them as, you know, scarlet tarts, things like that. You actually get out there and fly with them and they are an incredibly professional organisation. Heck of a, you know, great bunch of guys. And um, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed my two days with the team uh, in 2014 and 2015. In the day, I uh, had a couple of front covers, courtesy of Jamie Hunter, thank you Jamie, um, and uh, was also on the front of uh, Flight International magazine with one of my hawk shots last year, so thank you Craig Hoyle uh, for that, that was, um, that was awesome. So yeah, I've, I've got a couple of shots published. The favourite yep. shoot that I've done, bizarrely, was the um, Tutor Display team uh, back in 2015. Uh, and the reason that was good, once again, it's all about the people, so great little team, so Andy Priest uh, leading it up. Um, you know, superb display pilot, and then my um, my photoship pilot, a guy who went by the, uh, the call sign Disco. Okay, once once again, a pair of really really talented aviators. So seeing what they could do, t taking my you know sorty brief, and turning that into actual airborne results with an aeroplane that's let's face it, it's pretty underpowered. Okay, not really designed to be you know a, f a photo ship or a, a photo target and we got some cracking dynamic images out of that. And it's not to do with me sat behind the camera, it was about the guys putting the aircraft in the right position and, uh, and allowing me, you know, giving me the opportunity to take the shots. And they did a superb job. And to see this little light aeroplane operating effectively at the top right hand corner of its performance envelope, uh, it was really, really good to see. The guys did really well. Do you have anything you're very proud of? Uh, it was probably my front cover that went, on, uh, went in Flight International. Um, and then subsequently, probably about a month later once this thing was published, uh, the training officer on the squadron gave me his copy of Flight International when I was in a, a random back seat. So we went flying again with the Flight International front cover and I got a selfie with me, Flight International cover and a Hawk T2 in close formation, which was then published in the, uh, in the next month of Flight 2. So that was quite nice, but that's you know, just a bit of vanity, a bit of fun. And finally, where can we find your answers at? Um, I, don't really, I don't really have a website. Um, I do have a Twitter feed, but uh, it's just too much hard work, quite frankly. So I'll throw up images um, in places, you know, like a echo interview on, um, on Facebook and a couple of other Facebook sites. But um, other than that, there's no real central repository, I'm afraid.